Share Beirut presents Habib Haddad Yamli. Hello, Share. So today I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm not going to talk about Yemli, I'm not going to talk about Wamda or any specific thing. I'm going to talk about something I call the power of Yallah. It's a power that you know, allows us as individuals to create things and to build things very fast and very quick and be able to make an impact. Uh, in 2006, in 2006, there was a war in Lebanon. Israel attacked in atrocities. Um, and it was completely brutal. It was the first war that when I was alive, but I was not based in Lebanon, I was actually in Boston. And I can't tell you how much I was frustrated. I couldn't, I was glued to my TV every single day, but I couldn't do anything. And I'm sure a lot of you understand, I'm sure Sammy, you understand very well uh, how you feel the frustration being outside of your country and seeing things happen there very bad, but you can't help. So you know what, I said I wanna do something about it. At that time, you know, I was 26 years old, I had been engaged in a few community work in Boston. Uh, so I picked up the phone call, I emailed Red Cross in Geneva, Red Cross in Boston, and I pretended I'm this guy who runs a community of thousands and thousands of Lebanese members across the US. And I told them, listen, I want you to open a bank account for me, earmarked for Lebanon, uh, and we're gonna go and fundraise for it. And I want you to take no fees. They used to take 10% charge fees, no fees. I don't know how it happened, but it happened, and they said yes. And funnily enough, they created a bank account uh, for, uh, specifically for Lebanon, because people wanted to do donate, and they wanted to know that their money was going to Lebanon. And very quickly, we created this website called Relief Lebanon. Relief Lebanon um, started, and we had events, activities all over the US. Very quickly, it became a huge movement. In fact, in less than two months, we fundraised $2 million, and I could not imagine I could do that. Uh, it was always anonymous, and Luckily, I found people online that today, still today I haven't met, two people, one from Seattle, one from Chicago, and we teamed up and we did this, uh, this project. So a project that came up really just from a, from a need and from frustration. This is, for example, California. They sent us this thank you of all over California. Um, so basically a need and a frustration to do something. So what I learned in this particular project was A, lower the frictions. You know, people wanted to give back. They wanted to donate. They wanted to help but it was hard for them to do so. so. Opening a bank account with the Red Cross and making it easy for them to do so, allowed them to do it. Number two is test assumption on a small scale, small scale. So first, I tried it in Boston, in a small community. I went to churches and mosques and asked people, would they donate? And everyone said, yes, we would, but what about money laundry, what about X, what about Y? Test your assumption, small scale, and then grow them very quickly. Partner to amplify your brand. I was a 26-year-old guy who would actually give me $2 million, but I got the Red Cross, UNICEF, and Mercy Corps to put their brands next to mine, and then all of a sudden we became something huge. And always, always build a great team. So that summer, I wanted to search for news online, and I couldn't type on an Arabic keyboard, uh, because you know, typing on an Arabic keyboard, as many of you know, is some, and stuff, because we grow up learning how to type on an English keyboard. I, was wanted, I wanted to search for news, because I wanted to know what's happening next to my parents' house. So I couldn't, but I was chatting with friends using English words, but typing Arabic, Arabic words, but using English letters, you know, the chat language. So I said, why can't I take that and make it real Arabic? Again, I saw a problem, I decided to do a solution. So today, Yemli, after four years, we have enabled more than four billion words. That's equivalent to um, 1.5 million Wikipedia articles or 50, 57,000 books. So, and, as I built Yemli, basically, in the beginning, um, I also focused on one thing, team. I obsessed, I went back, I found a great person, a great engineer, was a co-founder. I remember I used to go to the gym, use the elliptical next to him. I hate the elliptical, but just to talk to him, to convince him to come join me, and then we, we built that. So the things I learned, maintain uh, uh, flexibility, maintain persistent flexibility. Have your vision where you want to go, but be ready to iterate. At the beginning, we wanted to be a search engine, and then we wanted to, to allow everyone to type, then now we actually serve uh, different kind of consumers, like banks and institutions. But really maintain your, 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 your vision and, and make sure you iterate around the, along the way. Ideas are, much better, ideas are much worse than execution. Ideas are worth nothing. Execution is what matters. And in fact, Google, Microsoft, and a few other companies copied us. 
But the, way, the reason why we, we beat them is because our execution was much better than theirs in this particular context. Distribution, distribution, distribution. You can have the best product in the world, but if people don't use it, then you don't matter. You have to focus on that early on. So again, build a great product, but make sure that people use it. Right investors that will support you, but also, again, the, the great team. So as I was building Yemli, I had the chance to get the press exposure and the conferences. So I went, came to the Middle East, I was based in Boston, came to the Middle East, went to Lebanon, Jordan, Dubai, and all over, and talked to entrepreneurs. And I was seeing the obstacles they were facing. And quite frankly, those were obstacles that I was lucky and have, I was, had the unfair advantage of having my support back in Boston. So I said, you know what? There's something here that, that is wrong. I see the problems. Press don't cover entrepreneurs. Investors, there's no right investors. The investors invest in balance sheets, not in humans. Uh, talent, people don't really want to work in startups. That was four or five years ago. A few of those things, mentorship, people are not helping you and guiding you through, through, throughout, that, throughout your journey. So I decided to do Yala Startup. And Yala Startup was done by myself, Eli Khouri from Upra, and Sami Shalabi, a fellow entrepreneur in Boston. So the idea was to see the entrepreneurship revolution. In uh, 2010, we did the first startup weekend in, in the region, and we had more than 300 people uh, come into this event. We had people come in, we call them geeks on a bus from Jordan and Syria. They slept at the, at the venue. And in one weekend, they did 34 startups. What, what I felt there, what I learned is, you have to think big, because you have to start small. But prototyping and iterating is very important, and that was all something that I learned by seeing the, the individuals in that one weekend create so many startups and be, and be so excited about that. In fact, a few of those have continued and still, still live till today. Again, build a great team. That was 2010, summer 2010. Uh, January 2011, the revolution in Egypt started, in Tunisia before that, and again, I was in the entrepreneurship space. And I happened to be friends with many of the people behind the revolution, at least from the online world. And those, because those were entrepreneurs, they saw a problem, they had the skills to do that, and decided to, to do something about it. So I was, again, based in Boston at that time. And if you remember well, the internet was shut down on January 27 in Egypt. No one had internet. People were actually uh, freaking out because the news would not come out of the streets to come to the internet world where actually the government and the regime were put under accountability if they were to do something obscenely atrocious. So Google and Twitter, they came up with a project called Speak to Tweet. In just one weekend, they created a project where people would use their phone and their voicemail and their, 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 their cell phones, call in a number, leave a voicemail. That voicemail would be recorded and then tweeted out on Twitter. I happen to know uh, Steve Crossan and Kate Jacobson, who work at Twitter and Google. I remember Steve uh, ch chatted me on, on mon Monday morning, telling me, Larry Page gave me the go on Sunday, we did the project and we launched. Now, that was great, but the one problem was the voicemails were in Arabic. So the Western world wouldn't understand what, what's happening, and they couldn't really, again, monitor the situation and do something if something was going wrong. So I sent a simple tweet. I said, can people help me translate those? I had more than 1,000 translators sign up to, uh, uh, to, uh, to like in a, few, in a few hours. We came up with a Google Doc, a simple Google Doc. We put a list of voicemails. Voicemails would come in from speak to tweet. People would listen to them, they would translate, and they would collaborate on those. We had about thousands of, of, of tweets translated into French, English, Chinese, Albanian, you name it. And we even had a system where people would go and make sure that uh, the, the tweets, the voices were not something wrong. In fact, I remember at one point, the, the regime in, 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 e in Egypt found out about it and they blocked it. And for a few hours, you would hear the same voice saying, the regime is great, nothing is happening. The regime is great, nothing is happening. And we were talking with Al Jazeera to, to come up with uh, banners on the, on, the, on the bottom to put the numbers. Then we had to change our strategy because again, uh, we didn't want people to know the number, everyone. So we had to go it through back channels. We did it under Creative Commons, which was great because uh, MSNBC picked up one of the voicemails and they tweeted, tweeted it uh, all over the news, which had a lot. This is a graph of the, all the tweets coming in, all the voicemails, and you see that around January 31st, you start seeing a lot of those, uh, 30, 31st, and only 27, it was cut down. So this is the power of Yalla. In only a few, a few days, do something very quickly, iterate, and, and, and solve a problem. So again, lower frictions, leverage your own assets. In my, in my case, I knew the Google and Twitter people. I had a startup in the Arabic space, so I knew the translators. I leveraged my own assets, 
and also was a great team with me working on that. Today, what I do is I run a platform called WAMDA. We are here to support entrepreneurs, and the way we support entrepreneurs is in three main things. We have a media arm where we cover stories, and again, I saw that how important it is to cover stories and spotlight and educate the market. We have a fund. In less than a year, we've done 12 investments in early-stage startups. We're very fast. When we find a great team, we go for it. And we have programs and products like events and other things like that. What I know from, from Wanda is you have to know your problem very well. It took me you know, a number of years until I understood really the problems of entrepreneurship and how to solve them. Think big, but again, start small because you need to have, give yourself time to iterate. And again and again, build a great team. There's a huge overlap between activism, nonprofit, and entrepreneurship. All of those, they see a status quo, they think status quo is stuck, and they want to do something about that. And this is what I call the power of YOLO. Uh, and basically, in, as a summary, the power of YOLO is defined by a few things. A, it's doing versus extensive planning. In fact, it's much more important for you to have a compass rather than have a map. The compass will tell you where to go. The map is much more expensive and much more costly to build. Leveraging on your own assets. Build your assets as you grow, individually as and as a company, and then leverage those as you grow. Iterate and be always be, be ready to be flexible and change. Distribution is key. A product, an idea, everything could be great, but unless people use it and leverage it and benefit from it, it doesn't matter. Surround yourself with a great team, and finally, think big and dream big. Thank you.